uh, everybody to the um, to the Midas webinar um, today. Uh, today we will uh, hear from the scenario modeling hub, the COVID-19 uh, scenario modeling hub. And um, before we start, I would like to um, welcome everybody and also make a quick um, announcement that uh, for the first time um, we have um, the uh, simul like live uh, interpretation of the webinar into Spanish for our colleagues from Latin America and also from other Spanish speaking uh, places. Um, there is a button at the bottom of the Zoom call next to your raise your hand uh, and all these uh, share screen and all these other buttons that says interpretation. If you click that button, uh, you can select um, uh, Spanish uh, or English. And if you click, click on Spanish, then you will hear the um, interpretation uh, in Spanish. So we're very excited about this. And also moving forward, we hope that that will help to make the work from the Midas network more accessible um, and useful to uh, people in Latin America and other parts of the world. So um, it's my great pleasure now to introduce the speakers of today. Um, uh, all have been worked really hard in the last weeks um, and months on establishing the COVID-19 scenario modeling hub. We'll hear from um, four different speakers um, um, and I'll just introduce them briefly here and then uh, we will go into the talks. Um, um, we'll hear from Rebecca Bortring, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Penn State. She's working with a group uh, with Kat Shia um, and also uh, others. And she um, has also been involved in the um, multi-modeling um, outbreak decision uh, MMODS uh, project. Uh, also, we'll hear from Sean Trulove, who's a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, working with Justin Lester's group. Um, and uh, we'll be hearing also from uh, Brian Lewis, who is at the uh, University of uh, Virginia uh, at the Biocomplexity Institute, uh, and uh, from Alex Vespignani, uh, one of the modeling uh, groups as well, uh, who is a professor in physics at Northeastern University and director of the Laboratory for the Modeling of Biological and Social Technical Systems. And I think we all have heard a lot from Alex already in the past and from that group. So it's very uh, exciting. Uh, Rebecca and Sean will introduce the, um, the Scenario Modeling Hub project um, uh, as part of the coordination team. And then Brian and Alex will give their um, presentations as the participating uh, modeling groups. So um, we will first have Rebecca and Sean uh, uh, present, and then there will be time for questions. Uh, and then as Brian and Alex will talk, we'll, they will talk and they'll take questions directly after their talk. Um, I would suggest that people put in their questions in the chat or in the question and answer box. Uh, and as we have time, we may or may not um, um, allow people to speak uh, live and then just ask that question directly, which is a bit more interactive and, and uh, fun, but uh, we'll see how many questions there are and what time we have. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Rebecca and uh, please um, go ahead. Great, thanks, Wilbert. Um, very happy to be here uh, to talk about the work that we're doing at the COVID-19 Scenario Modeling Hub. Uh, and I'll uh, first want to thank everyone that's involved. Uh, so we have many uh, people on the, both the coordination team and then I would definitely like to thank all of the modeling groups that contribute projections. Uh, this work would not be possible without them, uh, as well as thanking our collaborators at CEC and Northeastern who have been crucial to these efforts. So I think probably many of those on the call are familiar with uh, the COVID-19 forecast hub and uh, for COVID-19 uh, cases and deaths, uh, this hub has been really instrumental in showing one to four week ahead forecasts. And when I pulled uh, this data, there were over 35 models uh, from different groups. And so they each capture potential trajectories of the pandemic and then they're aggregated into an ensemble, which gives an overall idea of what uh, the modeling community is thinking will happen in the next few weeks. 
So a distinction between what we're doing and the forecast hub uh, is that the forecast hub is um, focused on predictions about what will happen more on the short time, short, short term, whereas uh, we're focusing on projections, which are estimates about what could happen given uh, particular scenarios. And these longer term uh, projections, once you start thinking about longer time scales, the importance of considering different uh, possible outcomes is really important, as we've seen with rapidly changing uh, policy, uh, behavioral uh, choices, whether to move or not, uh, Thanksgiving. Um, it's really important to take into consideration some of these ex extra unpredictable, sometimes unpredictable factors, uh, and they're really important for planning interventions that take place over longer time scales, like vaccination campaigns. So uh, before I get directly into the COVID-19 scenario modeling hub, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the project that I worked on, uh, the multiple mo models for outbreak decision support, as it was also concerned with print projections over a longer time scale. So about a year ago, there was a science policy forum that outlined this possible uh, framework for using multiple models to inform decision-making and we executed that framework in the case of COVID-19 uh, and the objectives we wanted to minimize public health burden. And in this particular case, we looked at workplace reopening strategies ranging for, uh, so it was for a particular community of 100,000 individuals. And these strategies ranged from uh, staying closed after a period of quarantine and uh, shut down or immediately reopening. And these projections were over six months uh, and 16 modeling groups contributed 17 models of six months projections for cumulative infections, deaths, peak hospitalizations, and days closed. And uh, part of the framework was this intermediate discussion with the groups to share ideas and also limit uh, areas of uncertainty that we did not want to incorporate. Uh, so differences in interpretation of the scenarios, uh, and that's based on uh, key practices of expert elicitation. Um, and then, so after this intermediate discussion with the groups, uh, everyone reran their projections and we obtained our results. And so these have uh, two main dimensions, rankings and uncertainty. Um, so you can see in this particular case, I'm showing for the open scenario, uh, the metric cumulative infections consistently, all of the groups uh, ranked the open scenario as the worst possible choice if you want to limit it cumulative infections. Orange is a tie here um, between worst and second worst. Um, but then the aggregate uh, is a key component because it uh, encapsulates the uncertainty. As we can see, the projections from the different teams are a bit all over the place, but um, some of that uncertainty is something that we want since there were uh, and our scientific areas of uncertainty that we just aren't sure about. Um, and so these are changing and uh, rapidly changing, which transitions into the COVID-19 scenario modeling hub. Uh, so it's similar in a few ways and different in a few ways. Uh, so again, it was an open call to modeling teams that we did through the CDC and MIDAS um, weekly calls. And MIDAS was instrumental in building, helping us build infrastructure for submissions uh, to be processed through GitHub. And then now uh, with the Scenario Modeling Hub, we're going through more rapid rounds that are able to change. Um, so we're able to change scenarios for what's going on uh, in terms of where we are in the vaccine rollout, um, other aspects of what we're seeing that are important. Um, and then also we can use other modeling groups use uh, up-to-date data. Um, so we stay current. And then we now have weekly team discussions. So we are continually um, sharing insights and also honing in on the key sources of uncertainty that we're actually hoping to uh, characterize, get an idea of. So I'm, as I mentioned, many more rounds. We've done three so far before the one I'll primarily focus on today. And through discussion with decision makers and other public health professionals, We've um, settled on this two by two framework where on one axis, we look at different levels of non-pharmaceutical intervention uh, maintenance or reduction. And then on the other axis, different levels of vaccination 
administration. Uh, and then another key area of uncertainty that we wanted to characterize was the emergence of the B117 variant. And Sean's going to get into a bit more specifics on the development of the scenario. So I'll just uh, quickly um, show some results that we're uh, happy, excited to share. So for round four, we had six modeling teams and I'm showing the ensemble projection at the national level um, for a period of six months. That was the projection period forward. And the national ensemble uh, is built up from state level projections. And there are a few things that probably jump out uh, to you. So we just see increases in April um, and peaks in May uh, in all of the scenarios that were modeled uh, with different, uh, slightly different timings and peaks. Um, and, but we do see, so vaccination uh, is important in bringing down um, the reported cases, hospitalizations and deaths uh, to the lowest levels that we see in the projections, but whether or not um, there was a low or moderate decrease um, in employee compliance uh, does change um, the projections as well. Uh, so a brief detour to method uh, methodology. Uh, our current ensemble method uh, is taking uh, for each quantile, so each group submits 23 quantiles uh, for each target scenario every recombination. And then we take the median of those quantiles to get the ensemble. So uh, this is a particular example of median projections for US deaths in the high vaccination, low NPI scenario. And we can see um, the gray lines are the different models. And then the blue curve since there are six models is the average of the two uh, central, um, the two central most projections. Uh, and so we are looking into different ways of aggregating a different ensembling methods, particularly Emily Howerton um, from Penn State is um, looking into this uh, that we hope our or think may allow us to capture other areas of uncertainty um, that are of interest as well. Uh, so what do we do with these reports? Uh, or what do we do with these results? So we have a report uh, that we share with stakeholders of the CDC, White House COVID-19 data team, uh, Coronavirus Prevention Network, WHO. Um, and uh, it contains uh, key takeaways, um, as well as all of the state specific results and national results. Uh, and so this uh, is primarily targeted at uh, stakeholders that really want to dig into the details, um, but we also have a public website. So Wilbert was sharing at the beginning, um, but is also um, soon to be shared our new um, updated version, again, hosted by Midas and have had a lot of help from Northeastern, uh, as well as all of the modeling groups and uh, everyone involved. Um, but this is really to uh, make our results approachable for a broader audience. And uh, there are lots of links to the GitHub submission site, which has really detailed uh, descriptions of how to participate. So uh, we're always emphasizing that new groups are welcome. Uh, so I've uh, included the, the link here to the GitHub and uh, also a contact email if you're interested in joining. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Sean. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Oh, it looks like you have to stop sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I guess, get into a little bit of the weeds a little bit more in terms of our scenario design and projection uncertainty and really um, thinking a bit more about how we're trying to both control for uncertainty between the models. Um, Sean, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you oh, yeah. want to shift your screen around um, because we're looking at your presenter view. Okay. Ah, sorry. Thank you. Huh. I thought I clicked the right one. There we go. Thanks for the heads up. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so this is really looking at kind of how we're trying to capture um, uncertainty within these scenarios and across these teams uh, and control for some of it as well as allow for 
uh, the you know the broad capture of uncertainty across multiple groups, which is you know, really the goal of this multiple modeling approach. Um, so, as Rebecca touched on briefly, um, we're focused on this kind of two by two format where we're looking at uh, two levels across two factors that affect the long term projections. And so, for this previous round, for round four, we've really focused on uncertainty, uh, controlling for some uncertainty within vaccination, as well as uh, behavior control. A behavior and control changes or NPI. Um, and many of you have probably seen many headlines or are directly working in this uh, yourselves, but we've seen quite a bit of uh, change over the last several weeks, several months uh, in terms of vaccination, you know, uh, increasing levels, reaching hesitancy, uh, shifts in vaccine effectiveness, things like that, as well as quite a few changes in control measures and behavior um, with, you know, some of the uh, states opening up quite a bit more, lifting mass mandates while others are, are maintaining control levels. Um, and there's quite a few other areas of uncertainty that we're really leaving uh, at the liber liberty and expertise of the teams. For round four, one of these particular areas was the new variants and how the increase in the B117 variant would in impact the projections uh, both near and long term. Um, so just to quickly uh, touch on some of the areas related to vaccination uncertainty that we're uh, both accounting for within the scenarios as well as um, allowing for even more uncertainty between the teams. Um, there's there at this at that time during March and early April, there was still quite a bit of uncertainty about how many doses uh, would be available between the different manufacturers. There was still uncertainty uh, regarding vaccine effectiveness and uh, in particular, uh, against infection versus outcomes, um, how vaccination prioritization would continue to roll out and how that would impact the outcomes and how, uh, once we get to a point where it matters, how hesit hesitancy and saturation would affect these long-term projections. Uh, so one of the key strategies to delivering vaccinations uh, over the last several months has been prioritization of individuals at high risk for severe disease, such as older individuals. Um, and so while this can be a difficult to account for uh, in, the, in a large scale model, we can account for the impact of priorities, prioritizing vaccination by age um, through kind of adjustment for the proportions of individuals vaccinated. So this figure here on the left is something many of you are probably familiar with. This is the age specific infection fatality ratio uh, over various age groups. And of course we see as uh, individuals become older, the risk of mortality and severe disease increases quite substantially. Um, and so we've also been collecting data from across the states of vaccination by age group over time. And uh, so we see on this figure on the right, how that's how that's progressed from January, February to March in three states, um, with a lot of prioritization leading to high proportions vaccinated among those older age groups. Now, applying those two together, we um, can see that the infection fatality ratio, at least within our model, the Johns Hopkins Infectious Disease Dynamics model, we see this pretty substantial <laughs> decline in the infection fatality ratio uh, during those months of prioritization and then some stabilization as the rest of the population becomes eligible for vaccination. And empirically, we see some evidence for this across these three states, though, of course, uh, as with anything, empirical data is never as smooth and clean as uh, what we estimate in our uh, models and calculations. Um, so, uh, this is the, these are the full details of the scenarios from round four. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of detail specifically around vaccination, um, and I'll get into that briefly. Uh, we really specified for this, we tried to control for four different aspects of vaccination. Um, we specified a high and a low vaccine effectiveness or vaccine efficacy, uh, and this was specified against symptoms. Groups were allowed to uh, define the FF, sorry, effectiveness against uh, disease and infection differently if they chose to. Uh, we specified two levels, though they were very close 
in the actual quantity of uh, doses available from Moderna and Pfizer, as well as doses available from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine monthly. Uh, and we also specify two levels, kind of crude levels of uh, vaccination saturation. And um, the groups, again, within the framework of these of these uh, specifications were able to use their, their expertise to define how these uh, guided implementation of vaccination and uh, effects of vaccination over time. So we also specified uh, two levels of control measures. And we did this by basically defining a reduction uh, or scenarios of a reduction of NPIs or a reduction of control over time specifying March 2021 as that baseline from which reduction occurs. And so for the more optimistic scenario, we're assuming that there's a reduction to about 50% of those March levels by the time we get to September. Uh, in the more pessimistic scenario, we're assuming that uh, control measures go down to only 20% or an 80% reduction of control uh, by the time we get to September 2021 in the United States. Um, and these are pretty crudely defined, um, but at least give us kind of a, a, uh, a range uh, from which we can make some assumptions and control what could happen and uh, really try to inform decision making based on, you know, changing control, implementing new measures, repealing measures, etc. So, um, <clears throat> While we try to control for those specific factors with vaccination with, and with uh, NPIs and, and behavior change, there's uh, quite a bit of uncertainty captured by the differences in the structures of these six models. Um, so, so first, there are quite a few similarities, as you might expect. Um, all six models use some form of a compartmental structure. Uh, some are using a metapopulation type uh, structure, others are not. Um, all of these models are currently assuming permanent immunity from immunity from both natural infection and from vaccination. Uh, and all except for the GLEAM, uh, MOBS GLEAM model are not assuming any sort of importation at the current time, though I believe that others may start to account for importation in the future when it becomes more critical to uh, the pandemic within the United States. Uh, additionally, all of these models are calibrated to past data. For some, that means fitting to the full pandemic from the start, from January 2020, and then running it all the way through. For others, that includes applying some, some ratio of reported cases to infections uh, using serology or other data to calibrate this ratio. And we did check with all the teams and try to uh, make sure that everyone was kind of in the same ballpark in terms of the initial uh, susceptible numbers uh, at the beginning of the simulation. So they, we do believe that they are kind of all at the same uh, basis when they start their projections. Um, there are some, of course, key differences between these models. That's really going to capture, uh, you know, quite a bit of uncertainty within these projections and allow for us to, to um, give a, a broader uh, look at what the possibilities of the future are with this pandemic. Uh, these include quite a bit of variability in the geographic detail, age structure, and connectivity between the models. Uh, only one model is explicitly modeling competition between two strains. And one of the models is using two separate models for each strain, each variant. Um, and others are not using a, a multi-strain model, but accounting for multiple strains in some way or another. Uh, there's also major differences that are not captured here, including that some models account for seasonal, seasonality while others do not, um, and some other small details that, that affect how these uh, models are projecting cases and infections and deaths. Uh, there are also quite a few similarities and differences in terms of the vaccination variants and NPIs and how those are being accounted for within these models. Um, so <clears throat> everyone is essentially assuming NPIs relax linearly over time. Uh, most models are assuming that the vaccination effectiveness against uh, infection is similar to vaccination effectiveness against disease, though there's some variability there. Uh, and pretty much everyone is assuming a similar level of transmissibility advantage of the B117 variant. 
Uh, but there are some really important differences between these models. And these, I think, are driving a lot of the uncertainty and uh, variability between their, their projections. Um, one of these key areas is how models are accounting for uh, the NPIs or control measures. Some models are explicitly uh, defining and fitting NPIs using a combination of mobility and intervention data, while others are lumping NPIs into their estimates of the transmission rates and doing some estimation from that. Um, there are also some differences in the assumptions of hesitancy, and we believe this might be driving some of the differences towards the summer months where some groups are accounting for uh, higher levels of, of uncertainty or variability in that uh, hesitancy during round four. Um, and while most of the models are using a pretty similar R naught, there is some variability there, so that could be driving some of the differences. And I think a key one during, uh, <coughs> excuse me, during uh, this round four, a key difference was uh, how the dominance of B117 builds within each of these models uh, in various locations. And that, that can drive quite a bit of the difference in terms of timing of different peaks uh, for the different states within the models. So from all of these dif differences, we see a wide range of variability in the estimates of the impact of the different scenarios from the models. So here is a figure of the excess percent of reported cases, hospitalizations, and deaths projected to occur under the scenarios with reduced vaccination or MPIs as compared with the most optimistic scenario, so high vaccination, uh, moderate MPIs. And so you can see there's quite a bit of variability um, among each endpoint, especially, of course, whoops, uh, when you look at the, um, the low uh, scenario, the most pessimistic scenario. Um, and there's also quite a bit of uh, variability captured across states. Uh, most of the, are, um, and this, this is, uh, you know, really driven by the uh, dynamics and uh, occurrence in these states. We have Arizona, which has had very large waves early on, uh, and really most of the models and these ensembles are projecting that there would be very minimal, um, minimal uptick in the waves going forward. And that's, you know, they probably have a lot more natural immunity that most of these models are assuming. In Maryland, most of the projections are assuming some sort of wave, though, somewhere around below, maybe slightly more than the winter wave. And then pretty much across the board, everybody assumes that Michigan uh, is having and going to have a large wave, at least from this previous round of simulations. So we see quite a bit of difference uh, across the states, which you know gives us some confidence that these models are actually providing some useful information uh, and hopefully useful to uh, policymakers and decision makers within these locations. Um, so just uh, as a quick takeaway, scenario design is quite complex. Um, we are using quite a bit of input from stakeholders from the White House, from the CDC, uh, state health departments, trying to define questions that are both actionable uh, as well as tractable within our definitions. Um, there is quite a bit of trade-off between the st having strict guidelines and allowing freedom uh, between the teams or within the teams. Um, you know, it's, it's trying to control and make sure these things are comparable by, while also allowing the expertise of these teams to really give us what, um, what is valuable from these projections. And there's quite a few unforeseen events. And this is, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons why we do the multiple rounds and why we're trying to, why we're trying to be quite rapid with this. Um, formal validation is quite challenging with this because these are projections and there is no uh, real ground truth to compare to. Um, and uh, we do find that model variation is driven primarily by these assumptions uh, between the model structure, transmission advantage, and timing of the new variants, various assumptions about NPIs, and assumptions about vaccine hesitancy. So for this round, um, it seems that, uh, you know, a lot of the uncertainty surrounding vaccination has kind of um, been uh, understood in terms of vaccine efficacy, numbers of doses available. But now we're getting to a point, excuse me, where um, saturation becomes a bigger impact and the variability in saturation 
between locations is really kind of starting to show up. And I think Brian's going to touch on this right after me. So I will hand it over to him uh, and he can uh, kind of guide you through what they're doing in their work. Brian? Thanks, Sean. I'm glad to proceed, but I think there's a couple questions that came up. Maybe Cecile. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Want yeah, to thanks, um, um, Ryan. So, um, we have a few questions and um, um, let's first go to the question that uh, Jacob put in the question and answers. Uh, I think Rebecca wants to answer that one. And then um, if people do have questions, you can raise your hand. We can let you talk as well if we have time. Um, Rebecca? Great, thanks. Yeah, so I wanted to address Jacob's question. Uh, so that there's a bit of a difference. Uh, so with our projections, as opposed to forecast, it's not exactly clear what validation would be since there's not a ground truth that we would be comparing our projections to uh, since the different scenarios make assumptions about what could happen. Um, it's not as clear what we would be comparing to to do that validation. Um, so we are aware there are several ag aggregation uh, methods and we're looking into different options, but it's uh, more about capturing uncertainty than uh, validation. Thanks. Um, let's go to a question from the chat that uh, maybe Sean can answer um, from um, Daniel Hubert um, asking, how are the models developing their baseline parameters and fit to the outbreak in the US? If you could say anything about that. Yeah, so it varies by team. Um, like I can speak for our team and I think this is similar for uh, Alex's team and I don't know, Brian, maybe for you guys too. Um, but we're running the projection of the simulation all the way through from January 2020. <clears throat> so we have kind of that baseline of uh, natural immunity kind of built up over the past year uh, and then running it, you know, continuing to run it forward. I think some of the teams are using, uh, as I mentioned, serolo serological data um, and estimates from the CDC and other places to um, define the ratio of cases to infections and then use that as a baseline of, of the natural immunity in the population. Thanks, Sean. Um, I think um, we want to, we have two more presentations to go. There are a couple of questions coming in. I would say if the presenters can answer those through the chat or through the question and answer box, uh, and then if there's time at the end, we can still come back to some of them. Um, but I would like to kind of move forward uh, with the Brian's talk um, as to give him enough time. And then after Brian's talk, he can take questions directly um, about five minutes and then we'll move to Alex so that he has also time for his talk and some questions. Hey, Brian, go ahead. Sure, yeah, go ahead and stop me if my slides aren't showing up right, but I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of our, our attempt to sort of understand vaccine acceptance and um, model it as that's sort of the big question now. We've been working um, quite a bit with the Virginia Department of Health and uh, trying to tie in some of our work with them. Uh, you know, this is the big question. They're already seeing appointments sort of slow down. Um, just a little bit about us. I'm Brian Lewis. I'm a computational epidemiologist. I've actually been a part of MIDAS since the very, very, very beginning. I was lucky enough as a grad student to start up um, uh, with Stephen Eubank back when we were at Virginia Tech, but now I'm at the Biocomplexity Institute at the University of Virginia. Uh, we've been doing this pandemic response modeling uh, since the 09 influenza, worked a lot with Ebola, uh, Zika, and many, many others. And I also just want to take a moment to say I am just one person that's speaking for a very large team of folks at the Biocomplexity Institute uh, that have worked on this, uh, many people running models, etc. Uh, so vaccine acceptance data sources. I'm going to break it down to these two. There's multiple other surveys out there, uh, but these two are sort of comprehensive and um, one conducted by the census and these sort of household pulse surveys. Uh, those get updated um, with a little bit of a delay and they cover generally about a fortnight of time. Uh, the COVID cast Facebook survey we've been using for quite a while. Uh, this does get updated daily, uh, but it has the bias of being administered uh, through Facebook. And so the uh, way we've been using this COVID cast uh, surveys here in Virginia is like taking a look at what the overall acceptance is. You can see this blue line here. We're getting above 80% of the respondents saying that they've been vaccinated or they definitely or probably would take the vaccine if offered today. 
But the important part to notice here too is the green line is who has, of these respondents, how many have been vaccinated? Uh, and it's showing that we're up into like almost the 70s here uh, in the last week or so. And Virginia has been doing good on vaccination, but we're nowhere near um, the 70% level. So it's reflecting a little bit of the bias in this particular mechanism. People who take time to answer surveys about vaccination uh, and COVID on Facebook maybe are more likely uh, to want to take the vaccine or to have been vaccinated already. But it's still very, very useful in the group of folks that haven't been vaccinated or those who are more hesitant uh, list their reasons. So there's like uh, top reasons are side effects, safety, and distrust and distrust this light blue line you can see has sort of shifted up quite a bit once we got into April time frame and then reasons that they might uh, change their hesitancy or they might be swayed uh, are also show up here and that's this brown line here of sort of the top line being recommended by doctors or by friends and so these are useful things uh, from an operational point of view for uh, VDH, the Virginia Department of Health, and so we've been trying to incorporate that in some of our modeling support we do for them on a, on a weekly basis. Um, if we look at vaccine acceptance overall by, by region, so we can look at this COVID cast data and get the more granular um, county level areas and we can aggregate that up, we can see that even within Virginia, much like um, the U.S. as a whole, there's quite a variation of vaccine acceptance uh, across our Commonwealth here. And so you can see the northern region, which is up around Arlington uh, and Washington, D.C. area, uh, has the highest level of acceptance, sort of at the moment measured at about 88 uh, percent. And then other regions like the eastern, which is down here in Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach area, as well as the far southwest, which is uh, area uh, I used to live in down in near uh, Blacksburg and Virginia Tech, which is the, the, the southwest of Virginia, a little bit more rural, more Appalachian. Uh, and those have higher levels of uh, hesitancy or lower levels of overall acceptance. Uh, one thing we did is we took the levels of uh, vaccine, uh, reported vaccine uh, vaccination levels uh, and looked at that against the VDH's measured administration data, which does drill down into the county uh, level, and you can see this discrepancy. And so we were able to calculate a correction factor. And we just use that correction factor blankly against this acceptance level to shift it back down. So you might have an 88, uh, an 80% acceptance level, but if we're only seeing 50% of people have been vaccinated or 40% of people have been vaccinated in that particular area, uh, then we then shift that back down based on the number that had responded they've been vaccinated. And so with that course correction, um, we've adjusted these numbers to, to reflect that. And so I'm gonna try and give a little bit more evidence about that uh, at the national level, uh, just to support a little bit of discussion. Maybe people can use this uh, in their models if they aren't already. Uh, and so if we look at this nationally with this correction, uh, we're taking late rates that are sort of normally up in the 80% uh, range and they're bringing them down into sort of more of the 50 uh, to 80% range. And so you can see quite a bit of fluctuation across the states. You can see uh, Wyoming and Alabama places are a little bit lower on the overall acceptance uh, levels, whereas New Hampshire, um, DC, and a few of these other areas have uh, quite higher levels of acceptance. And then the nice part is that this survey can also be broken down age specifically. And you can see that there's a bit of difference in the different age groups. So if you look at 65 plus, uh, you have higher levels of uh, acceptance overall. And it seems that these surveys in some ways are biased to not find um, folks that have already been vaccinated. And so you're actually, uh, when you correct for it, uh, you actually push it up even higher. And so we actually max out at 100% uh, in many of these when we use this just simple um, correction factor. But on the flip side, the 18 to 64 group, and it, it gets even uh, stronger the younger you go, you have higher levels of folks reporting that they would um, get back, uh, they would get vaccinated, but the correction factor drives it even lower. And you can see this sort of varies across the states as well in terms of that gap. Um, when we look at the household pulse survey administered by the census, we can see similar kinds of variation in the ages. Uh, and so that's a nice um, correlation there. We haven't quite gotten to the uh, to adjust these household pulse surveys for the number reported to have been vaccinated already. That's uh, work in progress, but we can still see the same kind of variation that we see in the um, in the COVID cast survey. So if we do a quick analysis to sort of look at the correlation between this sort of Facebook administered um, 
uh, survey and the household pulse survey, you can see that they're pretty well correlated, um, uh, but not, not absolutely. And you can see some states that uh, fall off the sort of the line here a little bit more. Uh, we look at a Spearman rank correlation over here on the right, and you can compare the sort of uncorrected COVID cast, which is uh, labeled sort of FB actual in this um, confusion matrix right here, as well as the uh, household pulse survey, which is HPS acceptance. So it's reasonable levels of correlation in terms of how the different states are ranked. Um, so that gives us a little bit of confidence that we, we're measuring some truth there. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's good to see. And then there's higher correlation, obviously, within the corrected and the uh, uncorrected um, Facebook survey. So just trying to provide a little bit of extra information here. One other thing we thought of is we also have this flu vax um, uh, information. So if we're looking at the 2019, 2020 uh, season, we can see what the overall levels of acceptance and administration of that vaccine was across states. Uh, you can see that as a whole, that's a bit lower than what the reported, uh, even the corrected values of vaccine acceptance for COVID, which is what would one would really sort of expect. Uh, but you can also see that this household pulse survey is on average, at least across the states, uh, a bit higher nationally uh, than, than what even the Facebook survey sort of measures uh, raw before we do the correction. Uh, and then to get to the modeling part, which I think is a little bit uh, interesting and, and conclude here, basically what we try and do is take these state level thresholds and we even break it down to age specific thresholds. Uh, and then we take the vaccination rates uh, at these different age groups across the states. We sort of combine these two things together and we sort of look at what the schedule might be for vaccination into the future and then when it might bend over and get saturated uh, so that we can then create these age specific, state specific vaccination schedules. Uh, and so this is just a very sort of busy data graphic just to sort of reveal, but basically you can see the course of the 18 to 64 year olds and the 65 plus year olds. Uh, and you can see in West Virginia, which is a state that achieved pretty high vaccination early on, you can already see that their actual observed vaccination rates have sort of started to bend over. And so the model will sort of pick that up as we take these um, in time. Uh, and so anyways, we throw this in the model, we use those schedules, we use the calibration, everything Sean nicely described there, and we can get an estimate of the past, current, and future population levels of immunity. Uh, you can see a lot of that's going to be made up of vaccine. And then if you look across the states, you can see where this vaccine acceptance threshold sort of slows down the progress across this rainbow over time. And so here we are sort of at the beginning of May in this like pale green color. And you can see where each different state rides on there, how much progress they might be able to make over the course of May based on the, the rate that's currently occurring in that state. And then they all sort of peter out like Alabama and some other states are going to start to peter out as they run up against their acceptance thresholds. And so with that, um, I'll conclude by saying a few of the next steps is we wanna do a, get into this age specific um, comparison uh, between the COVID cast and the census survey, maybe use the influenza vaccination data to look at how this asymptotes to these thresholds, and then a deeper look at the sort of movable middle of these people that are answering probably yes, probably no. Um, let's look at that in a state and age specific manner and then also assess progress here in Virginia because we're going to coordinate with the Virginia Department of Health and see how they focus their ad campaigns and some of their outreach efforts and see how that maybe they can shift some of the, that middle towards uh, getting vaccinated. And maybe we can build a model that could be more broadly applied uh, and be glad to share that. And so with that, I'll conclude and glad to take any questions or pass the mic to Alex. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. Very nice to see this kind of dive into one of the models that is contributing to the Scenario Hub. Um, we're a little running behind, so I would say um, let's give Alex the opportunity to um, present um, his uh, modeling effort um, for the Scenario Hub and then um, go take questions for the both presentations. Um, or, of course, people can continue through the question and answer or the chat that have been quite active. Um, please, Alex, go ahead. Hello. So do yes. you see the slides? Yes, good. Great, perfect. So I will talk about what is the modeling effort uh, within the, the hub, and I will focus on the problem of 
uh, of tackling uh, the, the, the variants uh, and how they have emerged across the United States and especially the heterogeneity that is resulting out of this, uh, this process. So uh, the, the model we use is a, is a multi-scale modeling framework. And so we uh, have our global, uh, uh, global model uh, uh, and that integrates uh, uh, real-time data of uh, international and domestic uh, uh, travel flows that have, we have been collecting across uh, across all the the, the the past time of the pandemic, and so that allow us to have this basically global description of of the pandemic. And what what we do is to uh, use a model that is multi-scale in the sense that we work in the United States uh, at a very fine uh, geographical level. So at this point, we work uh, at the county level. And so we have uh, a description of the epidemic at that level. Since this is computationally not viable for the level of, uh, of simulations that we do worldwide, what we use is that at the global level, we have a more coarse grain approach in which we use uh, about 4,000 um, uh, census area it, and and uh, in those census area we use an age structure uh, uh, model but then we have a more uh, homogeneous description of, uh, of the disease but we can keep track of all the uh, individual movement uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, due to the travel flows and instead in the United States we work at the at the county level we we integrate the Google mobility data in details a school closure age structure that is based on on a synthetic population and that allows it to a, a much uh, greater description of the results at the same time this strategy allow us to explicit modeling the introduction of uh, uh, infections uh, uh, with the B117 strain from the UK. And so, and then model the, uh, the domestic, uh, uh, how to say, path to dominance of that strain by taking into account the time of introduction, the place of introduction, and then the, the, the internal circulation in the United States. Uh, the model, uh, 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 as uh, uh, Sean was saying, and, and, and I think for Brian too, we uh, we start from from January. The model is calibrated initially uh, uh, or internationally on data that comes from the early uh, spreading of the epidemic. But then in the United States, we include all these uh, uh, timeline of interventions that uh, are transformed in uh, changes to the contact matrices. Uh, and uh, and and the various uh, and the implementation on those of the various uh, uh, non pharmaceuticals interventions uh, the we also use uh, uh, a specific uh, uh, calibration for what is the uh, infection fatality rate so that we can use death uh, data to uh, to calibrate uh, to to calibrate the model, uh, as we were saying, we uh, do an approximate Bayesian computation to calibrate the model. Since uh, basically the onset uh, of the epidemic, you see here uh, some some plot for some of the states, uh, but this is this is the expensive part of the, the the computation and 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 the computational modeling because we we need to basically simulate a global epidemics uh, at uh, quite uh, fairly detailed level globally, but at a very highly detailed level in, uh, in the United, within the United States in order to have uh, the, the number of uh, runs and simulations that, uh, that, that can be used for the ABC uh, approach. Well, when we uh, talk about the B117, what we did in the model is to include explicitly the two strains. So we have a model, a multi-strain model with the two strains competing and, uh, and described uh, at the individual level, uh, both of them. Uh, and in addition, we have uh, the full description of the, of the vaccine uh, allocation and distribution process, as well as the 
different uh, uh, compartment uh, describe individuals in, uh, in the first dose, second dose, et cetera, et cetera, in order that we can modulate the uh, efficacy of the vaccine uh, across the different uh, stages of the, of the inoculation. Here uh, is the plot that you see on your right is where we are trying to convey the message of uh, how much uh, is uh, uh, heterogeneous, uh, the path uh, to dominance of the B117 across the United States. You see that some places like, uh, you see the north, uh, the northern corridor uh, got uh, got uh, importation of the B117 earlier than other states, uh, and and you have basically a hierarchy. Uh, obviously, on, on in a different situation, that won't be that much of a difference in timing. We are talking about. Uh, uh, mostly uh, a couple of months, but for our purposes here, in terms of uh, of uh, uh, effect of uh, of the B one one seven on the transmissibility of uh, of COVID nineteen is 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 quite is quite relevant. And you see that really there is there is a large heterogeneity. Here, I want to stress that this heterogeneity doesn't end at the state level, but actually goes down within the states. So if you look within Florida, you will see that in Miami, you have a path to dominance that is much more accelerated than other places in, in, in the US. Uh, these are the results that we uh, have in one of the main scenarios. And uh, you see, this is at the United States level. Uh, this is for the, I think, the high vaccination and uh, moderate uh, MPI relaxation. Uh, and uh, uh, however, again, I just want to stress uh, here how uh, there are differences across uh, across uh, uh, states. Here I we. I picked up three three states: Arizona, Illinois, and Texas. And you see how they have different uh, different trajectories, and the different trajectories re are reflected in different uh, in different uh, uh, estimated uh, uh, RT or uh, effective reproductive number. It's also important to uh, to remark here that that you know the fact that the the, the the RT doesn't go above one. Doesn't uh, doesn't mean that the B117 is not uh, is not uh, how to say on a path to dominance. Indeed, you see that even in Arizona, there is a, an increasing trend of uh, of the R effective just because of the 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 the, the, the more uh, pre for the the prevalence of, of B117. And so the, I think this is the the main message here is that really heterogeneity is, is extremely important in in this uh, in this. Uh, uh, these projections across the United States. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, great to see um, another model like that um, and what it can include. So I think um, there has been quite some back and forth in the question and answer box and in the chat box. So I would say um, first, if anybody, we have five minutes for questions. Um, you can raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask, and then we can just unmute you. Um, that may be the easiest way. Or um, I think, Alex, that was a quick question about uh, what the lowest scale model is that you include, or the lowest scale um, um, in the multi-scale model effort. Um, and then I don't think what if there are other questions out there. Well, there were quite a few questions about waning of immunity. I don't know if, uh, if Alex, you, you have thought about that in your model and, you know, you think that might. It, I, I think at the moment, uh, I, I believe that uh, if I'm not wrong, most of us do not, uh, do not consider uh, the waning of, uh, of immunity. Uh, this is something that probably moving forward that will be important to, to assume. Uh, I, I, I would say that at this point with respect to what we have in the round for uh, simulations, then one of the main issues is, is to introduce the, the, the hesitancy uh, trajectory that uh, it's, uh, I, I, it's going to affect what, 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 what we project, but waning it will be important if we think probably down in, in Early, early fall and uh, and winter. 
Maybe we can say a little bit, uh, there may be groups on the call that would be interested in joining the scenario modeling uh, hub effort. Maybe Alex or Brian can say a little bit about what it takes as a modeling group to be part of this effort in terms of um, um, effort and, and, and work, if it's easy to adapt your models or if it, if it's, if it, you know, how the tempo has been of the group and so that others can kind of think about what it would take from them if they want to join. Well, I, I think that, that it would be very, very important that other teams join the, the, this effort. Uh, uh, and, you know, multi-model assessment uh, really needs uh, re multiple models. So the more and, and modeling teams, the better. There is uh, an amount of work to do. And uh, I, I think, however, there is uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, feedback and uh, and value in doing these exercises also for the single models and 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 and, and the work the work that we do I, I i in my case i learned so much in terms of uh, exchanging uh, you know our vision of the pandemic and sharing modeling issues so i i i think it's it's it, for me it has been a great experience uh, uh, and and i hope many other teams will be able to 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 join and i think it's important to say that we have those uh, rebecca was mentioning those conversations uh, every 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 week which are extremely uh, I, I would say are extremely important to 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 move the, the scenario hub uh, forward but as well i think uh, it, it's important for us modeling teams in in the work that we do uh, every day so it's it's uh, it was really good experience brian yeah, yeah, I just echo in. I think the more the merrier, and like we really do the, need the multi to be more than just a little bit more than a few. Um, and I would say that, yeah, as Alex alluded to, like the conversation and the ability to sort of, there's shared work there too. So there's ideas that sometimes are tricky to come up with that either you improve what you've already done or, you know, make a decision to not do something that was taking a lot of your time. And so it does sort of balance out in that you're learning and advancing things, not having to carry as much of a load. Um, but you know, there is a schedule and you got to keep up with your uh, colleagues. And so that, that does take a little bit of a, a burden, but if you're already doing these kinds of uh, modeling efforts, the coordinating team does a good job of sort of having a light touch on the wheel in terms of how they specify this, the scenarios. And in some ways, the specification also makes it easier. They just say, hey, it's going to be 83%. You just use 83% and don't spend two days analyzing data to get the heterogeneity across 83%. So it sort of has a trade-off one way or the other. Thanks, Brian. And then maybe I wanted to ask Rebecca for the last minutes, maybe she can say something about you know, there are lots of rounds um, uh, of scenarios that are being published. And so do groups have to contribute um, everything required from each in each round? Or are there ways to join or kind of start joining without fully committing? Um, and also then as last, um, um, can you, you know, does this give modeling groups the opportunity to have their models included in communication with decision makers? and uh, moving forward, help influence the, the course of the pandemic? Yes, definitely. Thanks, Wilbert, for that uh, question. Um, so definitely, yes, it's not mandatory to participate in all the rounds. Uh, if you're participating in a round, I think full participation in the round is uh, required. But um, we are welcoming always. So um, we're working on round five now. There will be round six uh, plus. So. Um, definitely consider for joining and you don't have to contribute to all rounds. Um, and then to the second question of, will your models be uh, seen? Um, so yes, uh, the particularly the report right now includes all of this separate model information. We've been working on different visualization methods to show more. So Sean had tables about the assumptions and we're working on um, incorporating model diagrams too into the website. Um, so it is, yes, your model results will also make it to the decision makers and are, will, are available on the website when you contribute them. Um, there's a lot of information, so it gets distilled down to the ensemble um, for like sort of the first plots. But yes, uh, your specific model uh, projections will also be shown. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've reached the end of the of the 
the webinar. It was a whirlwind uh, quick tour of the scenario modeling hub, but I hope people get the idea of what's going on here. It's really complementary to the forecast hub um, and it takes a lot of work from the modeling groups and is highly appreciated. I hope you get some sense of that. And also um, the recording of this webinar will be posted on the Midas website. The emails of all the people are posted the, the, and the links will be also available through the Midas website. So hopefully uh, join and ask, uh, contact us uh, or just the, the main Midas uh, questions email address if you want to uh, know more about this. And then thanks to all the panelists and um, hope you all have a great day and a good weekend. Thanks, thanks everybody. Everyone, you too. Thank you.